Hello friends! My name is Cindy and I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And today we're going to start reading Who Was Harriet Tubman? And this is by Yona Zeldis McDonough. And it says on the back, a former slave who risked her life to help other slaves escape to freedom. A nurse who saved soldiers' lives during the Civil War. A Civil War spy who helped the Union Army. So shall we get started? Who was Harriet Tubman? Here's a picture. No one knows the exact year in which Harriet Tubman was born. It may have been 1820 or 1821. Almost everyone thought the birth of a slave baby wasn't worth remembering. Born a slave, Harriet Tubman grew into a brave and daring young woman. She was brave enough to escape from slavery. She was daring enough to help others escape too. Because she led so many to freedom, she was called Moses. Like Moses in the Bible, Harriet Tubman believed that her people should be free. And she risked her life many times to help them become free. Even after she had escaped safely from the South, she went back to take other slaves north to freedom. Here is her story. Chapter one, life in Maryland. Sometime around 1820 in Maryland, a slave named Harriet Ross had a baby girl. And here's a picture. <coughs> Neither Harriet, who was called Old Writ, nor her husband Ben could read or write, so they couldn't record the year of the baby's birth. No one else thought it was worth doing, but Old Writ loved her tiny child and wanted to protect her. She hoped her little girl, whose nickname was Minty, would learn to sew, cook, or weave. Then she could be a house slave and avoid the back-breaking work picking crops like tobacco, corn, or wheat in the fields. Old Rit and Ben had been born slaves. They had many children, all of whom were slaves too. Black people had been slaves in the United States for a long time, ever since 1916, when blacks from Africa were capped kidnapped and brought on slave ships. This is a schematic of what the slave ships looked like. To Virginia, slavery had been a part of American life. By the early 1800s, most of the northern states had stopped slavery, but the southern states had not. Slaves like Ben and Old Writ worked very hard, yet they were not paid for their work. Instead, Ben and Old Writ lived on land owned by their master, an, a man named Mr. Brodus. This land and the many buildings on it was called a plantation. <coughs> Mr. Brodus's plantation house was large and grand, like so many of those in the South. Ben and Old Rit could see the Brodus's big house every day, but they didn't live there. They lived in a log cabin like the other slaves on the plantation. Slaves' cabins were very small. They had no windows. The floors were made of dirt. Piles of worn out blankets were the only beds. Still, for little Minty, this was home and she loved it. As soon as she could walk, Minty joined her brothers and sisters and other slave children who were watched by an older slave. The littlest children ran and played naked. The older ones wore a coarse linen garment. None of them wore shoes. Still, they had fun. Summers were were warm and bright. They swam and fished in the many streams and creeks. Even though she was a slave, Minty was happy. She loved her parents. Ben, her father, told her stories about the woods. He could name the birds. He knew which berries were sweet and tasty. Bought and sold. Slaves brought to the United States from Africa were sold at auction to the highest bidder um, who bid the highest amount of money for them. Groups of black men, <coughs> women, and children were brought together for this purpose. Auctions were advertised with signs and newspaper ads. White people came beforehand to look over the slaves. They pried open their mouths to check their teeth. They pinched their arms and legs to test their muscles. Even worse was the way an auction could tear a family apart. A mother might be sold to a plantation owner in Mississippi, while her son or daughter might be sold to a plantation owner in Louisiana. The two would never see each other again. Husbands and wives, parents and children, brothers and sisters were cruelly separated. In 1859, a plantation owner named Pierce M. Butler sold 436 slaves to pay off money he owned. It was the largest slave auction on record in the United States, and it was called the Weeping Time. <coughs> 
The slaves, all of whom were born on Butler's plantations, were brought to a racetrack in Savannah, Georgia. They were put in stalls meant for horses while they waited for the auction to begin. By the end of the two-day event, all of the slaves were sold away from the only home they had ever known. They would never see their family or friends again. Minty's mother told her stories from the Bible. From her mother, Minty learned about Moses. Moses had lived thousands of years before. He led his people, the Hebrews, Hebrews out of Egypt where they had been slaves and into freedom. Around 1826, when Minty turned six, her life changed. Mr. Brodus hired her out. This meant that she had to leave her parents and her home. She had to go live and work for white people who could not afford to buy a slave of their own. The day she had to leave, a wagon came to take her away. Minty did not want to go. Her two older sisters had been taken away. She remembered how they had cried and cried, but she had to go, but they had to go anyway. And so did Minty. Minty worked for a woman named Mrs. Cook. Mrs. Cook was a weaver. She spent her days in front of a big noisy loom. Minty helped her wind the yarn. The air was filled with fuzz and lint. It made Minty cough. She dropped the yarn. She couldn't concentrate. Mrs. Cook got angry. When she was angry, she would punish Minty by whipping her. Slaves were whipped often. That was how the masters made them behave. Mrs. Cook told her husband that Minty was stupid and slow. So Mr. Cook had her help him instead. He was trying to catch muskrats. He set out traps by the river. It was Minty's job to watch them. It was cold near the river, but it was quiet too. The air was clear and fresh. Oh, here is the trap. And here they are by the river. One day, Minty woke up feeling sick. Mrs. Cook thought she was pretending so she wouldn't have to work. Just as always, Mr. Cook sent Minty out to check the traps. She went down to the river, shivering from fever. When she got back, Mrs. Cook saw that she was really sick. She sent Minty home to her parents to get well. Old Rit took care of Minty for six weeks, but then it was back to Mrs. Cook and the loom. Minty could not learn to do the jobs, so the cook sent her home again. The cooks sent her home again. Next, Mr. Brodus hired Minty out to a woman named Miss Susan. Minty, who was only about seven, had to watch Miss Susan's baby. If the baby cried, Minty was whipped. At night, she sat by the baby's cradle. She rocked it gently, but Minty was tired. She would fall asleep and the baby would begin to cry. Then Miss Susan would get angry at being woken and Minty was whipped again. Minty learned to stay alert for the baby, but it was hard. She was always tired. Once when Miss Susan's back was turned, Minty reached for a lump of sugar that was in a bowl on the table. She had never tasted sugar. Slaves were rarely given candy or treats. It looked so good, but Miss Susan saw her. Furious, she reached for the whip. Minty was too fast. Out the door she flew. She did not stop running until she was sure Miss Susan was no longer chasing her. But what now? If she went back, she would face a whipping. <clears throat> Minty found a pig pen. She crawled inside to hide. She was very young, but she was bold. She tried to fight the piglets for pi potato peelings and other scraps of food, but the mother piglet, a pig, pushed Minty away. After five days, Minty was filthy and starving. She knew she would have to return to her mistress. Later, Minty would say, I didn't have anywhere else to go, even though I knew what was coming. Nat Turner's Rebellion. Born around 1800, Nat Turner was a slave in Southampton County, Virginia. When he was little, his mother told him that he would one day lead his people to freedom like Moses in the Bible. She had memorized verses and whole chapters of the Bible and she taught them to her son. Turner grew up to be a preacher. Other slaves called him the prophet, which means teacher. He was a silent, moody man who spent a lot of time alone. Turner believed what his mother had told him, that he had been chosen to lead his fellow slaves to freedom. In 1828, Turner announced that there would be a certain sign letting him know it was time to rebel. On August 20th, 1831, there was an eclipse of the sun. Turner thought that was the sign. He led a band of slaves from plantation to plantation, killing the whites they met. 
Wherever they stopped, more slaves joined them. Soon there were 70 slaves who killed 60 white people in all. The rebellion was broken up with the help of federal troops. 100 blacks were killed putting down the rebellion, but Turner was not among them. He stayed hidden in a cave for two months. Later, he was found. And on November 11, 1831, Nat Turner was executed. Instead of being hired out again, Minty was sent back to Mr. Brodus. Now Minty had to work in the fields, which was very hard. She split logs, loaded wood into wagons, worked the plow, and drove oxen. Minty had grown strong and sturdy. She could do the jobs, and when she was in the fields, she could see the sky and feel the wind. The other slaves talked while they worked. That was how Minty began to hear new ideas. She heard slaves who said they wanted to be free. Some of them escaped from the plantation. They went north to freedom. Others, like Nat Turner, started rebellions to end slavery. Nat Turner was caught and killed, but his ideas didn't die. More and more slaves thought about being free. Late one day in 1834, Mr. Brodus's slaves gathered with the slaves from another plantation to shuck the corn. They sang while they worked, peeling the pale green husks from the golden ears of corn. One slave stood apart. Minty watched him. He began moving across the field. At first, the overseer, the man who kept the slaves in line, didn't notice. The slave was halfway across when the overseer saw him. He shouted for him to return, but the man kept going. The overseer followed, holding his big whip. Minty followed too. The overseer was running now, chasing the escaped slave. The slave ducked into a store. The overseer ran after him. The slave was cornered in the store. The overseer called to Minty. He wanted her to help him tie up the runaway slave, but Minty didn't move. She stood watching the two men. Suddenly, the slave pushed past the overseer and was out of the store, gone. As for Minty, she blocked the doorway so the overseer couldn't follow the slave. The overseer picked up a heavy two pound weight and threw it at the runaway. The weight missed the runaway slave, but it hit Minty on the forehead. She fell unconscious and bleeding. She was brought to old Rit who nursed her tenderly. No one thought Minty would live. Still, old Rit cared for her daughter night and day. Eventually, Minty recovered from the wound, although it left a scar on her forehead. It wasn't just the scar that made Minty different now. People treated her with respect. Although she was only 13 or 14, she had defied an overseer. No longer was she called by her childhood name of Minty. Instead, she was called Harriet, her mother's name. Clearly, she was not a child anymore. Chapter two, looking for the North Star. Harriet was not the same after she got well. She suffered from headaches. Sometimes she had sleeping spells. One minute she might be awake and talking. The next she would be sound asleep. The spells frightened her. She heard a rumor. Mr. Brodus, her master, was going to sell her. He would sell some of her brothers too. What would happen to her? She might be sent farther south to New Orleans, Louisiana, or Natchez, Mississippi in a chain gang. In a chain gang, the slaves were chained together at the ankles to prevent their escape. The trip south would be long and hard. If Harriet fell asleep in the road, the overseer would whip her. He might whip her very hard and leave her to die. Her brothers would not be able to save her. Even if she could survive the trip, Harriet knew that being sold someplace farther south was a bad thing. That was where so many of the cotton plantations were cotton and tobacco. Plantation owners in the South grew many different kinds of crops which they could sell for money. Two of the most popular were cotton and tobacco. Cotton was used for cloth and clothing. The plantation owners needed many workers to plant and pick the cotton. First, the slaves had to pick the little balls of cotton from the cotton plant. Then they had to clean the cotton balls to make them ready for spinning. Slaves toiled long and hard um, to do this back-breaking job. Tobacco was another commonly grown crop. Slaves were also used to plant and pick tobacco. The owners of the big plantations knew that without slaves working for them, they would not be able to grow the crops that brought in their money. They told themselves that slavery was all right because they needed the workers. 
that the wealth enjoyed by the plantation owners was made from the blood and sweat of the slave slavers who owned them. Working in the cotton fields um, was very hard work. Also, going farther south meant she would be further from the northern states, further from freedom. Harriet did not want to be a slave all her life. She wanted desperately to be free. Harriet began to pray that Mr. Brodus would die. To her amazement, he did get sick and died soon after, and Harriet found that she was sorry. She believed it was wrong to have prayed for his death, but now she had a new owner who was more fair. His name was Dr. Anthony Thompson. Dr. Thompson hired Harriet and her father out to a builder named John Stewart. At first, she swept, dusted, washed clothes, and made the beds in Mr. Stewart's house. But she hated the work and asked if she could work outside with the men. Mr. Stewart agreed. Harriet worked alongside the men, uh, cutting down trees and splitting logs. She was a good worker. Sometimes Mr. Stewart let her take other jobs. She even earned money for her work. <clears throat> she had to give Mr. Stewart part of the money, but she could keep some of it. Harriet looked for more outdoor work, hauling logs, driving an ox cart, plowing fields, here she is paying what she has made. Harriet worked for five years for the builder. She became even stronger and more capable. She was more than 21 years old now, all grown up. Her father was teaching her things too. He taught her to move through the woods without making a sound. He showed her how to find the North Star near the Big Dipper. The North Star was a guiding light for slaves. It showed the way north, the way to freedom. Ben told his daughter that with the North Star in sight, you would know you were headed in the right direction. But what if it were cloudy night? What if there were cloudy nights and the stars were hidden? Ben told his daughter to feel the trees for moss. Moss grew only on the north sides of trees. Even without the North Star, the moss could help a traveler. Harriet listened to what her father had to say. She remembered his words. In time, they would help her. And tomorrow, we will read the second part of Who Was Harriet Tubman? I hope that you enjoyed this first reading of it, and I will look forward to reading to you again tomorrow. Bye-bye, friends. Thanks for stopping by. My name is Cindy. I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine.